So what I wanted to do now, so that's that little bit over and done with. And um, what I want to do now is um, basically um, introduce Sabuti. So I just wanted to say, first of all, that I'm really delighted uh, that we've got Sabuti with us tonight. So I've sort of been secretly hoping that we can um, get Sabuti to our Buddhist center. So this is the, the, best, um, the next best thing to have him with us in person, but not in the flesh. And um, just so you know, he's actually just over the, over the, the pond, as they say, over the Irish Sea in uh, the mountains of Wales. Um, so that's where he is. Um, and as we know, we're all um, dotted around the place, mainly in Dublin. And yeah, so th um, the first thing I wanted to say about Sabuti, just by way of introduction, is he's been a real trailblazer. So Sangharachula came back to England in the um, 60s, as, as we all probably know. And uh, he started this new Buddhist movement. And he was blazing a trail. But I, I think one of the things that we need to remember is that those um, first order members who came into the movement, they were also blazing a trail. Um, they didn't know how or what um, this new Buddhist movement would, would look like. And there was quite a number of people who really um, took that on, took that project on, and were, were bold and courageous in bringing something new into being. And I think Sabuti was one of the people who was right there at that time uh, making that happen. So my sense is he's, you know, he's, had, he's somebody who kind of sees um, an overview of things and is able to, with confidence, express a vision and a, and a strategy for how to move forward. And a lot, of, a lot of the success we've had as a Buddhist movement in reaching people, I think, has been due to that particular quality that Sabuti has. So I, I just wanted to rejoice in that to begin with, that he's been a real uh, trailblazer. Um, one of the things I personally appreciate about Sabuti and have appreciated about Sabuti is um, as a communicator of the Dharma. So I've been in numerous talks, um, some study groups, um, with Sabuti, and one of the things I, I really appreciate, um, there's lots of things I appreciate, there's knowledge, uh, he knows his stuff, um, but in particular the, the quality that I appreciate about the way he communicates is there's a kind of freshness to it. It's almost like I feel sometimes with Sabuti that as he's teaching the Dharma, he's sort of almost rediscovering it for himself, the magic of it and the mystery of it and the, um, the sort of freedom that it gives. So it, it's quite a sort of... Um, an enlivening and enriching and vivifying experience to study the Dharma with Sabuti. It's um, like a collective process of discovery. So that's something I, I really appreciate, that even when you've heard teachings before, when Sabuti's talking about them, it feels like something absolutely new, which I, I think is one of the qualities of, of the Dhamma itself, and he really brings that out. So, so that's another thing I wanted to rejoice in. And, and finally, uh, I know so many people consider Sabuti to be a really good personal friend. I don't quite know how he manages that. He does an awful lot and at the same time really values and really maintains and deepens and, and his friendships with people. And I know he's got numerous friends, not just um, in England, but in, in India and all over the world. So I just, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly um, hearing people rejoicing in Sabuti as a friend, members of the, of the order and, and people outside the order also. So that's just a little bit about some of Sabuti's qualities from, from my perspective. There's a lot more that I could say. Um, but without further ado, I just wanted to begin by asking a, a few um, little questions. So yeah, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Sabuti, is um, I just thought I'd ask you about your Irish roots. So apparently <laughs> you've got a few Irish roots. So I thought that might be quite a nice place to start. Yeah, I'm very proud indeed to say that I'm, I'm I suppose, quarter Irish. I like mm. everybody in England, of course. But uh, my grandmother uh, was born in New Zealand, interestingly enough. But oh, her, there's a little connection I, there as well. Oh yes, her parents were from uh, uh, from New Zealand. My great grandparents were from from India. From where, where am I? Ireland. Uh, <laughs> uh, my great grandfather was born in Ballinasloe, where uh, Badrashura comes from and left for New Zealand in the 1860s and uh, my grandmother was uh, according to my mother very Irish although she was born in New Zealand mm. Sabina Margaret Mullen you can't get more Irish than that uh, yeah and uh, my great-grandfather was a was a pub owner of course and you don't get much more Irish than that forgive the stereotypes <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah I'm proud of that and uh, I'm half Scots. My father was of, of Scottish origin on both sides. 
and a quarter Norwegian, and I just discovered from my genetic um, readout oh. that I'm 2.3% wow. Finnish. So I'm delighted that oh, there's somebody from Finland wow. here today. Where that came from, I have no idea. I suspect somebody slipped over the fence somewhere. Okay, so the connections abound there with... with um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful, oh, yeah, wonderful. yeah. Um, so I just maybe I could turn from that to just to in a way your kind of um, your um, Buddhist forebears and um, I just thought it might be lovely for people to hear about your first encounter with Triratna and, and Bhante back in the huh. day well I, I first saw Bhante I didn't know who he was uh, in London I, I lived at the foot of the hill on which he lived he lived on Highgate West Hill if anybody knows London and I lived at, at the bottom of the hill into Kentish Town, which, of course, was a very Irish area in those mm -hmm. days, uh, Camden Town and Kentish Town. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my landlady was, was from Ireland, indeed. But um, I used to go from that house up to Hampstead Heath. It's a very lovely uh, mm -hmm. open park in, in, uh, in North London. And I'd wander around there. And this was in the 1960s. Okay. So inevitably, I was often under the influence of certain substances. But um, coming off the, the heath one day, I, I saw walking towards me a, a very striking figure. Um, it was an older man with long hair, which was strange. We all had long hair, but older people didn't. He was probably in his 40s, I suppose. And he was wearing a long brown cloak, which he held sort of closed in front of him. And uh, as he walked, um, he was looking, well, the proverbial plough's length in front of him, according to the scriptures. And uh, I didn't know at the time what to call it, but in, in retrospect, I, I, I think he very much exemplified the, the quality of, of mindfulness and uh, self-possession, mm. some prajanya and, and smriti. Um, but it made a deep impression on me. And even now I can remember, I can see that scene and uh, the, the thought that came to me was something like, that is a mature human being. Uh, uh, you know, when you're, when you're young, I must have been 21 or something like that at that time, a rather young 21. Yeah. You, you become disappointed by the fact that adulthood doesn't seem to mean maturity. Yeah, you become right. more and more aware that older people are not necessarily that different from children in certain respects. But my sense was this: this is a, a real, a real person, a, a, an adult. So that was my very first impression of Bunte, and um, I saw him a little bit, a little bit afterwards, in Hyde Park, um, mm. at a concert of the Rolling Stones. Okay. I've told Bunte about this. He denies it fervently. <laughs> I may have wandered through the park at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but he was there. <laughs> uh, and, and then later, I, I heard about the, the only centre that we had at that time, which was in central London. Mm. And uh, I heard from my then girlfriend, who heard Bante being interviewed on Woman's Hour. And... Mm. Uh, he was that said, Marici, is it? That was Marici, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, he apparently said, he was asked, what would you do if a, a, a hippie came into your centre? Mm. At that time, I had aspirations to being a hippie. Mm. And he said, oh, well, I'd invite them in and uh, teach them to meditate. So I thought, that's the place for me. Mm. And the rest is history. Yeah, and, and, and you, presumably you got up the, the, the gumption to speak to the man at some point? I. Uh, yeah, not not very quickly. He scared the life out of me the first right. time I met him. Yeah. Um, I, I remember going down into the into the centre. It was in a basement mm. in the small shop in in uh, uh, Monmouth Street in central London, mm. which used to be a centre of the rag trade in Dickens' time. Dickens mm. even writes about Monmouth Street, mm. but it wasn't at that time. It was a rather shabby mm. sort of back street off. Um, um, the Charing Cross Road, no, not uh, Charing Cross Road, off Tottenham Court Road. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, it was a shop uh, which was owned by an order member who was a, a lacquer um, master, as it were, and used to repair lacquer work. Mm. Anyway, it was a strange shop because it didn't seem to sell anything. I suppose it was a Zen shop. <laughs> and, 
at the back there was a, a set of stairs going down into a basement, a tiny little winding staircase, um, and two rooms, one of which went slightly under the road and another one off to one side, and uh, quite a very small room, probably much smaller than your Dublin Buddhist Centre to get mm, today. So, so yeah. uh, you can't, no, no tears from me for your small <laughs> centre. Uh, but um, uh, I went into the, into the waiting room, and being a rather shy young man, I just made straight for the notice board and peered with fascination at the notices, um, you know, with unseeing eyes, just to hide from the gaze of others. Mm. And eventually plucked up courage to look out of the corner of my eyes. And there was Bante in his robe, um, sitting there at ease. I, I've, I've described it as being like a lion who'd had a good kill and had fed his fill. Mm. Um, and my immediate impression was of enormous energy mm. and of a sort of danger, mm. not not in, in a nasty sense, but of somebody who was, uh, well, I suppose you could say, uncowed by convention mm. um, and deeply impressive and rather scary. And uh, so you, it sounds like you were attracted to that. Oh, the very strongly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. And, 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 and I mean, it, it's always strange to hear of people who appear very confident to talk about them being quite shy and, and reserved. Yeah. So yeah. How, how did that kind of transformation in your own character take place? Well, I practiced the Dhamma. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I practiced the Dhamma and I participated in Sangha. Mm. And I think probably it, it, that's the biggest thing in, in, in the Sangha, in, in friendship, in the Sangha, you learn to expose yourself and you learn to uh, to gain deeper confidence in yourself and i especially think that uh, practicing metta the metta bhavna gave me greater and greater self-confidence I, I, I was sort of confident and not confident i suppose that's quite yeah. common isn't it i was very confident in a functional way i knew i could do anything yeah my class and background mm -hmm. uh, but in social terms i was acutely shy mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Yes, it took me quite a long time to overcome that, but I would say it's mainly through the practice of the Dhamma, and, mm. and especially of Metta Bhavna, and especially of friendship in the context of Sangha. And can you say what it was, what, what particular quality of the Metta Bhavna brings out that, that confidence, or is it, is it something that's magical and can't be explicated? Well, I suppose it's developing self-Metta, uh, you know, I, I, without thinking about it very much at the time. I, I, I didn't what is lack of self-confidence? I suppose in the end, it's a, to some extent a poor self-view. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and an acquired poor self-view, you know, you, 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 you've acquired in various ways from your upbringing. Mm. So through Metta, I learned to overcome that, uh, I would say. Mm. Self-Metta especially. Yeah. And then, as, and, and also learning to uh, let go of myself. You know, often a lot of self-confidence is, um, over focus on oneself right and uh, over concern with oneself and how one appears and so forth mm. it's a, a function of the times wasn't it that uh, you know from the the end of the second world war onwards um the, the increasingly the me generations one after another increasingly me -y generations have succeeded mm. and so i think that that um meta sort of relieves you of the burden of self because you enter into uh, uh, um, trans-self relations mm. uh, where you're in, in, in uh, a communication with others which, uh, in, in which the attention is not all on me. You forget yourself in a word. Yeah. Mm. But, so it sounds like in, in parallel from what I gather about those early days in parallel with this connection with Bante and, and you know, being aware of his qualities and his clarity and communication and so on that you're also developing these friendships with with other men and women of a similar kind of age and background yeah yeah almost everybody was the same age and background there, yeah. there was an older generation of order members mm. i was ordained in 73 right and the first ordinations were in uh, 68 i first came along in 69 mm. my goodness what a long time ago i was yeah. uh, uh, 25 when i was ordained mm. uh, you can now work out how old I am. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, we were all of that age because the older generations had mainly gone 
a few have remained, um, and but they were mostly just our age, not the the older ones who were already middle aged um, yeah. when we came across came along, and they start slowly drifted away. So the class was full of people of my kind, white, uh, middle class, educated, mm. um, uh, mainly English youth. Yeah. Um, although one of the first people who taught me meditation after Bante, Bante went away for a while to um, um, to Harvard, uh, not oh. to Yale. He led a he led a oh, right. yeah. a seminar in in Yale for a bit, mm. and during the period that he was away. Two people particularly led the class, and one of them was um, Taranatha, Carl Rag, who oh. was Irish, um, oh. very Irish. Um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yes, we were all quite young, and Bante strongly emphasized the connections between us. Yeah. And he was teaching the communication exercises. I don't know whether they're much done these days, mm. but we did the, um, the, the, the communication exercises very regularly. And they had a deep impact upon us. And Bante stressed friendship very much indeed. And that certainly had a big effect on me. And, and, from, there, and from there, things kind of, I mean, I'm always kind of aware of that early period as kind of presenting a, a possible kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of paradigm or, or a model for how things can develop because things did develop very quickly. Yes, I, I assure you there's plenty that is not a, a, a paradigm of how things should develop. We've made loads of mistakes and, uh, um, you know, others have had to pay for them. But um, yes, I, I suppose, yes, Bante uh, was a much more, much older than us, uh, much, much smarter than us, much better read and with a very, very deep grasp of the Dhamma and a tremendous facility for putting it across to us in uh, immediate terms. I remember being so deeply impressed once after a question and answer session. I think it was one of the first I went to. Well, it was the first I went to. I was thinking, this man isn't talking Buddhism. He's just talking, you know, what what I really want to hear. Right. In terms that I really wanted to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, we had that strong um, dhammic inspiration and leadership from him but also a, a deepening friendship between us. I remember that the very first retreat I went on, uh, I formed very strong connections with a, a group of uh, people, all of whom are now order members. Um, and I'd had very good friendships before that. I, I lived with a, in a sort of community with a group of people uh, and we were good friends, very good friends. But I remember on this retreat forming instantly these friendships which were of a quite different quality and kind mm. uh hard to say exactly why i suppose it's because they were based in the dhamma and uh that was a keynote of the times the, these deepening friendships and there were so few of us yeah uh, and uh uh very quickly we all started to take responsibilities i remember bante quite quickly asked me to organize a jumble sale oh, yeah. uh, jumble sale you know where you, i don't know what do you have them in ireland where you sell uh, uh goods that you collect from from the great british public and uh you put them on sale in a in a in a single session in the afternoon and you can make a few a few pounds um and we were funding our search for a new center on that basis oh, right. so bante saw that you know i was a good, i was obviously an organizer i was capable and asked me to do it hmm. But of course, that linked me in. It gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me a sense of uh, ownership, if you like, of the whole enterprise. It wasn't just something that was being done to me. It was something I was part of. Yeah. And he very quickly engaged us. I remember, for instance, very early on, he held speakers classes. Right. So he invited us to uh, together, a, few, a group of us together, and asked us to give short talks. And then he would give uh, feedback uh, very, very skillfully, beautifully, uh, you know, so that you came away feeling appreciated. And at the same time, you knew where you had to, to go further, how you could make it better. Never felt belittled or put down. That's, that's, that's quite a skill, isn't it? To be able to do that well. 
Extraordinary. Yeah. Can you say more about how he was able to do that? Because it's it's a tricky thing to be able to do. I, I don't have that skill, I'm afraid. I'm I'm rather clumsy in that sort of way on the whole. But I suppose it 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 means really being able to see the qualities that other people have mm. and being able to see how those qualities can develop. And I think this is one of Pante's uh, uh, great talents. That's mm. not, not really the right word. It's, it's yeah. great genius almost, mm. is to be able to see people as they are not yet showing themselves. Right. You see what I mean? Sure, I yeah, felt yeah, he yeah. did this with me very much. Mm. That he saw in me things that I didn't see in myself and that nobody else saw in me. Mm. And, um, and, you know, by and large, he was right. Yeah. And I've seen it with other people, people that uh, I didn't see anything in. And Bante could spot their qualities. And I think this is a quality of, of uh, you know, degree of, of, um, of spiritual development. You know, the Buddha yeah. has said, uh, on the eve of in, his enlightenment, to have gained the, the abhinyas, the, the mm. so-called super knowledges mm. and one of those super knowledges is to see where beings have come from and where they are going right mm. and i i take this not to be something sort of as as kind of literalistically esoteric as it sounds in the telling mm. it's more the ability when you look at somebody to see what what they've come from what what has shaped them mm. even to see the pain in them to see the uh, uh, the background that they carry, the uh, the and and to see the uh, the qualities that they carry, and to see where those could go, uh, the ability to see the seed and to know how to ripen it. Yeah. And I can definitely say that Bante saw that in me. I know that, mm. and I'm not sure that without uh, the the sun being shone on that um, that primitive seed. Mm. Uh, within me that it would have come to fruition in, in so far as it has done so mm. I, I, you know going back to the question of confidence yeah. i think it's bante's ability to see that in me that en enabled me to mature mm. it uh, reminds me of that, time. yeah it reminds me of that um sometimes meta is talked about as having a kind of nurturing quality that you oh, want yeah. you know yeah. like the like the, the the mother's love for her only child Yes, it, of, of course, it, in a way, one needs to be careful with that metaphor, because in some sense, the, the, the archetypal mother uh, just loves unconditionally. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the archetypal mother, uh, 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 um, you know, loves the child above all else. Mm. But th this, this particular nurturing quality is uh, to see the particularity of the individual and to see what they are capable of well of course everybody's capable of enlightenment but mm. to see where the growing tip of their capacity is yeah. and to give it what is needed to to grow mm. so it seems like one of one of the things that bante's done is is seen that as not just an individual thing but a collective thing that the conditions need to there needs to be a, well a community to order to bring that out which seems to be a particular I don't know, particularly unique kind of emphasis to see that kind of, um, I don't know, collective element of that as well. Well, yes, and of course, the collective element is really only achieved through the individuals, if you see what I mean. There is no, no super soul, as it were, or um, super personality, mm -hmm. but it's through the ability to see individuals and their potential and to see the, the, uh, their potential together that... Um, that the movement has come. I just wanted to kind of rush a, rush a long way forward now. And, um, you know, like, I mean, it's a little over 18 months ago that Bante passed away. Oh. And I, I suppose, I, I, firstly, I wanted to ask you just, I mean, he's been such, an such a, a force in your life and in lots of people's lives. And just how it's been for you these last 18 months to have that, I mean, a kind of like a, well, how's it been? <laughs> Well, I suppose, first of all, that, um, you know, I regret not being able to go and see the old fellow, uh, because especially in his last uh, years, his maybe last two years, especially, mm. he was in uh, a wonderful state. It was an absolute delight to see him. Very, very refined mm. and very, very subtle uh, and extraordinarily deep, like the blue sky itself, I would used to think. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of purified 
uh, all extraneous elements removed. As Bante was a human being, and as we all know, made various mistakes uh, and uh, had a personality which mm. was not always necessarily easy to get on with. I don't think I was a natural sort of fit with him in certain yeah. ways, in, in a working way, mm. in an Adamic way, we were very naturally suited to each other, but personalities not so much. Mm. But in those last years, it's as if he'd been fined away and that what you had was the sort of essence of Sangharakshita, of Urgyen, I think, rather mm. than Sangharakshita. Mm. So I, I, I miss just going and sitting in his presence. But uh, in, in many ways, I don't miss it at all because I feel it's with me all the time. Mm. Uh, that uh, that essence of Sangharakshita is me now. It's in me. It's all around me. I, I don't feel any loss of connection with Bhante. I feel uh, very much uh, uni united with him mm. and uh, very much immersed in him. You know, I, I, I've... I've grown up because of him. He's been my Kalyanamitra. He's been my guru. Mm. Damn it, my guru. Why not say it? And is that is that when you we use the word again? Is that you 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 put a lot of store on that word again? Maybe you could say why and what that word what that word means. Well, I, I remember when Bante was at, had his sixtieth birthday, we had a a party for him at uh, um, at Padmaloka. We he had one of our the dinners, Bante was rather fond of these sort of formal dinners. Uh, no alcohol, of course, although we might have some some sparkling juice. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the uh, the heights to which we rose. Uh, but we'd all sit around a very formal sort of way, rather kind of 19th century sort of way. Um, and somebody, you know, we'd have some, some people would serve. It was delightful, actually. Mm. And Bante really loved this sort of ceremoniousness. Mm. And afterwards, after the dinner, it would usually be somebody uh, performing in one way or another. I can't remember what it was on that occasion. Somebody would sing or uh, recite a poem or um, play an instrument or something like that. And then there would be speeches. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I remember I, I, I was supposed to speak, but I couldn't really rise to the occasion. I, I found that once or twice with Bante that somehow or other the situation has left me a bit uh, dumb. Um, but be that as it may, Bante, no, it wasn't Bante, it was, it was an, 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 another order member who's a, a companion of his at that time, who read a letter that Bante had written to him. And in that letter, Bante had said that uh, uh, what he wanted to do from now on, hmm, no, I can't remember exactly how it was put, but it was something like this, that he, he felt that now he was becoming Urgien. So Urgen is the name that he was given when he was received from Kachu Rinpoche, one of his Tibetan gurus, mm. the Padmasambhava initiation. Mm. And during the course of the initiation, as is traditional, he was given a, a sort of initiatory name. Mm. And the name was Urgen. Mm. Urgen in, is the Tibetan for Udhyana, the Sanskrit Udhyana, which means, uh, the, refers to the area of India from which Padmasambhava came. He was supposed to be the, the, the prince of Udiana, which is arguably in somewhere in, in what is now um, Pakistan, Kash, uh, um, um, Afghanistan. Some people argue it's in modern Orissa in eastern India. But be that as it may, it's, it's the land of Padmasambhava. Mm. So being given the name Urgen was deeply significant to Bhante. And he says that from his 60th birthday onwards, he was felt he was becoming Urgen. And my sense was that when he, when he died, the last vestiges of uh, everything else disappeared and he became fully Urgen. Mm. In other words, fully the, um, what can I say? Uh, the, 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 the one who is uh, united with the Guru, with Guru Padmasambhava, who in a, in a sense has become the Guru. This is all rather esoteric, I appreciate, but I uh, hope you understand the metaphor. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm talking to people uh, who understand the importance of myth. I know that because you're mostly Irish. And uh, in Ireland, the myth has been kept alive in a way that I'm afraid in, in the other parts of these isles, or certainly in the English parts of these isles, we've largely lost. Mm. But uh, yes, Bante was 
was uh, sort of identifying more and more with the the archetypal dimension of himself you could say mm. and my feeling was that from his death onwards he he was or again and i feel that presence very much mm. even now even today even here and and what do you think i mean what do you think i mean he would be saying now in this very strange time does yeah. i don't know if, that, if you think in that kind of way or if he's been with you in terms of your own responses to the this pandemic the lockdown the all of the things that are happening around the world and Chiratna and beyond? Well, I, I, yeah, I'm pretty, I can't say what he would say specifically about all of that. Mm. But of course, in the end, what he would say is what, he, what we all must say mm. is that always, whatever the situation, take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Mm. Take refuge in the Three Jewels. That is your only refuge. Uh, uh, you know, and the ultimate refuge is only to be found there. It's not that the three jewels will protect you from getting the virus or any, any nonsense like that, mm. but that whatever comes, uh, the three jewels are the own conditions, and they will that uh, they are the only things worth taking hold of and holding on to. Mm. Even a movement, even an order, uh, as a as a um, historical phenomenon as it were, is, is, is not to be taken refuge in. It's a, a very, very important uh, expedience, very important raft. But in the end, we must, uh, we must look to the, the, uh, the three jewels because they're beyond all change. They're beyond all threat. Mm -hmm. So what else could he say, really? And, and any particular response he would have would be surely based on that. Mm. So, I mean, it's, you know, according to the, the Tantra and that tradition, I mean, one of the things the guru does is, is in a way makes the Dharma real and operative yeah. in actual mm. practices. Yes. Um, you know, in the here and now. And, and what, yeah. what do you think, you know, what, are, are there ways in which that going for refuge needs to be made more specific in this time? Is, oh. Are there opportunities that arise? Are there challenges that we need to face that, you know, mm. will make the most of the situation that we're actually in? Yes, well, uh, I, I'm. You know, I, I try myself to practice very much the the sort of teaching you get from Shanti Deva, and uh, and so on, you get from the great Indo Tibetan tradition, uh, and especially I try to take to heart the injunction to use whatever situation you are in as an opportunity to see reality, mm. uh, because reality is in everything. It. It, and uh, it's our illusions that disguise reality from us. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the more difficult the situation, the more opportunity there is for, for recognizing reality, recognizing the Dharma. Mm -hmm. So I coined a, a phrase as soon as the, the virus began to hit uh, these, these aisles, uh, which was that uh, the virus is our guru. Because in, in so many ways, the, the guru confronted our, our normal understanding of reality mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in a way that many people found deeply shocking. For me, it was, it was wonderful because I've locked down in the place I love and where I love to be locked down. I spent eight months here, six months here last year, locked down voluntarily. So I'm very happy to be locked down in a, a beautiful Welsh um, mountain scene. I'm very happy. Uh, but I know it's not like that for, for many others, uh, many, many others. And uh, so uh, I, I think that my great injunction to people, which is based on the Dhamma, based on what Bante taught me, was uh, use the difficulties as opportunities. And this comes from the direct teachings of Guru Padmasambhava. Uh, the, 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 the Dhamma is taking difficulties as the path. So whatever difficulty that comes before you, mm. it's telling you that uh, impermanence, insubstantiality, and uh, the omnipresence of dukkha within conditionality is reality. And if you recognize those, you become free and you can experience the joy of that freedom. So yes, I think that uh, this, 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 this particular crisis that we're facing, and it's going to go on for a long time, I know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm vividly aware of what it's like for people in India, because I'm in contact with my friends there. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yes, it, 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 if we can confront it on the basis of the Dhamma uh, by seeing that it's teaching us, well, we, we'll, we'll go much deeper and we'll be much freer and we'll be much better able to help others. Hmm. And 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 do you th like in terms of um, you know that's that's for us that's a teaching for us who are already going for refuge to oh. the three jewels. Yes. But what, what about um, people who don't know about the three jewels? Do, do you think it presents an opportunity to reach more people? Well, it sounds as if many more people are attentive, doesn't it? Um, I, it I like heard it. that huge numbers of people were booking for the the W Buddhist Centre's courses online. I know that. Um, Subhadramati at the LBC had 800 people mm. uh, signed up for a course. Not all of them had turned up, of course, mm. but that 800 people uh, signed up is, um, you know, quite something. Mm. You don't usually get that number to a course. So just as you were saying earlier, you just mm. don't get that number. Mm. Um, so clearly people feel the need for something and understand the Dhamma to offer them something, probably mainly in terms of the idea of meditation, or the yeah. idea of mindfulness. Mm. And Buddhism generally has a fairly good press in, uh, in Western society. I think it's probably the same in Ireland as it is yeah, in, in Britain. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yes, it's quite clear that there's a large number of people that uh, are paying attention. They're not exactly paying attention to the Dhamma. They don't know it yet. But they sort of know, well, some will be, of course, but they know that Buddhism makes you calm. Buddhism helps you to, to uh, face your, your mind. Buddhism helps you with your mental problems mm -hmm. and so forth. And Buddhism does all that. It's not really, you know, it's only the, the baby steps in, in Dhamma. That's shamatha in meditation terms. It's the early stages. But, uh, well, those in stages are important. And... Uh, that gets people where they're, they're really concerned. They're suffering. Mm. So many people suffering loneliness at the moment. Mm. So many people uh, are suffering a sense of meaninglessness. Mm. Why get up in the morning if there's nothing really to do? Mm. And you know, you can only do so much social media uh, after, for, for it to become a little hollow and shallow. Mm. Um, so uh, yes, I think people are looking for something to give them some mental solace and well they will get it if they if they learn properly mm. and uh, they pay attention also i think a lot of people just want some contact with people who are a bit confident and uh, have some sense of purpose mm. and so that that's something beneficial we're creating uh, what the the tibetan indo-tibetan tradition would call a karmic connection even if people don't take it forward just mm. that they've connected with the dhamma a little bit will be good for them in the future so it might be a, it might be a time where we can plant seeds that might not bear fruit now but maybe in the future yeah. people remember you know yeah. a little bit of buddhism that they yes yeah well i i, I mentioned the other day and you're hearing uh, uh Dara, the idea of what i call soft sangha yeah uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hard, hard sangha is where people actually come into direct physical uh contact and and uh enter into a direct Kalyanamitra relationship. But I think a lot of people, uh, especially under modern, uh, under these conditions of uh, uh, social media and uh, Zoom and so forth and uh, YouTube, uh, come into a soft connection, an indirect connection. Mm. But nonetheless, a connection is made, a connection is there. Mm. And in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, great importance is placed on this on this indirect, on this uh, connection, mm. the karmic connection, mm. which will fructify in a later life, the planting of a seed, which mm. will sprout later. Mm. I feel this with myself, that there were certain connections made very early in my life, which uh, uh, then sprouted a bit later in my life. So for instance, my father was uh, uh, an officer in the, the Royal Navy, the British Navy, and uh, in, in when I was about eight, went off on a, 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 a cruise as captain of a ship and uh, uh, went through, through the Middle East. Uh, and uh, um, his 
admiral entered a Buddhist monastery uh, where, as my father put it, he learned to separate his body and his mind and, uh, and his mind. And I remember when my father came back, he told me about this it, with, you know, a, a, a smirk and a bit of slightly cynical humor. Not that my father was very cynical, but, you know, good natured humor. Mm. But I was absolutely enthralled, yeah. really fascinated. And there was a picture in the, the sort of souvenir album of the, the, the cruise of the, the, the battle, the, the battle cruiser that my father was captain of. Mm. And there's a picture of the Buddha. Mm. And I, I thought, I want that mm. without really knowing what it was I wanted. Mm. So there was a seed planted, a very, very in dis distant, mm. you know, like a dandelion seed just floating mm. on the wind. Mm. Um, and landing in my my fertile little mind mm. and later that uh, predisposed me to the dhamma i suppose or mm. slightly predisposed me so I, i'm a great believer in this yeah. that, that we should be you know blowing the the thistle down the the the, the, the dandelion um uh i can't remember what we call them now but that they the the, the the down from the th the dandelion and blowing it to the wind and mm. seeing where those seeds land and the the internet gives us a wonderful opportunity for that sh that seed spreading mm. Mm. some to refer to the gospels will fall on stony ground mm. but some will will uh, fall on on fertile ground and and uh, and uh, fructify a thousandfold yeah yeah i suppose that you, you know there, there is a possibility when the plant grows that the 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 flowers release more seeds so the whole thing is cumulative yeah yeah mm. i believe we are in a unique time when uh, the dharma answers uh, as never before the hunger that people have in western society mm. uh, people have taken a big step away from god and i believe that in ireland probably people are you know because of their their, their loss of confidence in the catholic church for obvious reasons mm. are questioning their their faith but Nonetheless, they do have a sense of something, something more. I think this is one of the great virtues of Catholicism, if I might dare to say that. Mm. I, I got that from my, um, my Church of England upbringing, which in my early days was still very much a living spiritual uh, a tradition. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I got something from that too, a sense that there was something more. Mm. Well, I just couldn't take seriously the, mm. the terminology of it and the, you know, the what the the, um, the 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 church of england as the tory party at prayer i just couldn't take all that seriously mm. but it did leave in me a sense of something more and i think that's probably quite quite widespread in in ireland but you can't take it in the old form mm. so the, and the dhamma um you know has that sense of something more something mm. sacred but mm. not in um you know these hierarchical uh, cosmic hierarchical terms in the negative sense, or these ecclesial, ecclesiastical terms. Sure. It, it's much more fresh and human and direct and alive. Uh, and so uh, I think throughout the Western world, we have this sort of opportunity where the old models don't work and the new postmodern models just leave people bereft of any sense of, of, of value and direction. Mm. And well, the Dharma answers that so, so clearly, if we can get it across in the right way. Mm. And do you think there's any, in terms of getting across in the right way, do you think there's anything that particularly needs to be emphasized or pitfalls to be avoided or, because there's so, so many different ways you can put it across. Yes. Well, I think that the, 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 the big thing is always to communicate in a context of friendship and to communicate in a human way. Uh, you see so much of the Dhamma being communicated in the West with an exaggerated idea of the guru. It's breaking down rapidly under the assault of uh, uh, Western democracy, thank goodness. Mm. But um, one of the great things I think that Bante's given us is this emphasis on friendship and on communication in friendship. Mm. And, and for instance, we, he was strongly against the idea that we should consider ourselves Dhamma teachers. You know, you start getting the rhetoric, oh, we have so and so, we have these Dhamma teachers mm. at our center. No, we're all Dhamma teachers. We're all potentially Dhamma teachers. You're a, a Dhamma teacher when you are communicating humanly, mm -hmm. communicating with all the emphasis that Bhante placed on the word communication, communicating the Dhamma uh, mm -hmm. as human being to human being. Then you're a Dhamma teacher. Mm -hmm. 
But you don't think of yourself as a Dhamma teacher. You just think, well, I love the Dhamma. I really want to share it with others. And you try to do it. Uh, that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. I just try to share what I understand of the Dhamma with all my faults and failings, but in a living way, mm -hmm. in a human way, where I'm open to the possibility that others may understand already, may understand better than I do, but communicate human to human. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the key, that you, you keep a sense of yourself as a Dhamma fairer on the path. You don't bother about what level you've got to. I dislike all that uh, talk of you know, attainment and so forth. I think it's profoundly d uh, dangerous for the Dhamma because once you think you've got some attainment, then you start to uh, with, have some uh, attachment to that attainment. Mm -hmm. But you just think of yourself as being one who loves the Dhamma, who's got some experience of the Dhamma, who wants to share it with others, and you always remain open to the possibility that they already know or know mm -hmm. deeper than you do, deeper mm -hmm. in some ways than you do. And you enter into a real human communication. Mm. And Bante so much emphasized this quality of communication, which is more than just, you know, speaking some words to somebody else. But it's a quality of, of uh, attending to, with your energy, to the energy of another. And do you think, um, uh, well, one of the things, when you were talking about soft sangha the other morning, um, one of, the, one of the questions that arose in my mind, maybe I can ask it now, is I suppose I've always had an idea that if you're going to communicate the Dhamma, uh, you have to kind of be able to follow up with people in terms of friendship and community. And hmm. one of the, I suppose one of the concerns that I have is like, it's, it's all very well to teach loads and loads and loads of people how to meditate, but, but are you creating a sort of impossible problem where you, the, the, the Sangha isn't big enough to be able to really meet people's hunger for, for depth? Hmm. Well, you just don't know what's going to happen with people. Uh, um, but anyway, to, to uh, um, it, yes, it, it, it's true that the that the importance of personal connection cannot be overemphasized. It's very important that people make contact and that they enter into uh, kalyanamitra relationships with others, both vertical and horizontal and that they enter into a sangha. It's very important for people to be able to make substantial change. That is critical. However, um, you just don't know what happens when uh, people start to meditate. They do an eight-week talk, a course. They learn to meditate. They get some experience from that. Perhaps they'll go to another Buddhist group. Mm. You know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm very loyal to Tri Ratna, and uh, I, I love Tri Ratna. I can't say that it's the best because I don't know every one, but I'm pretty confident about what we do have. Mm. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, very confident of our growth, overcoming our faults and failings and so forth. But who knows? They may go somewhere else and that may be what they need. Mm. And I'd be very glad of that. Uh, I hope that they find something in the Dhamma. They may find it somewhere else. Mm. Yes, I, I, I believe that the Dhamma expresses most clearly uh, what is so something that is very deep in reality itself and very deep in human consciousness, but people will make steps and grow in other ways too. Uh, maybe through art, maybe even through some other religion. But uh, so I don't mind as long as they grow. Mm. And I hope that some will be able to make their way to us and that we will be able to um, um, connect with them, that they will become part of the Sangha and find their way more and more deeply uh, into it. But I, I, I'm, I'm not particularly worried if they don't. Yeah. Uh, I don't think much harm is likely to come of it. Yeah. You yeah. never know what may happen, but I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, and I think if harm does come of it, the, the, it would have come from somewhere, if not from, from us, if you see what I mean, or from learning a bit of meditation. Yeah. So no, I, I think it's a good thing to spread our seed widely. But at the same time, it's very important to have openings, portals, through which people can enter into the Sangha. Mm. But we will not be able to incorporate 800 people from one course. No. We'll probably be able to assimilate three or four at the most. But, uh, you know, those uh, 700 and tumpty tum who don't make it through a portal will nonetheless do something with it. And it will take them somewhere. It, it, seem, it seems like one of the things that Bante did is kind of encourage people to make connections with each other 
so that the whole thing is beginning to kind of grow exponentially rather than relying on the on the on the core that you already have if you see what i mean i, I don't quite follow that well it's it seems like um you know, you can kind of think of what the Sangha is at the moment. Huh. And then you can think, well, the people that are here at the moment need to meet all these new people. Huh. And, but there seems to be, I don't um, know, yeah. a possibility that in a way those new people themselves become the Sangha and the whole thing begins to develop in that kind of way. Yes, I think there is something rather mysterious. And I hope you don't think I'm just reverting to my LSD days. <laughs> but I think there is something at the psychic level. So, you know, you cannot believe how different our movement is now from what it was in the early days. Mm. Of course, fundamentally, it's the same because it's the same Dhamma and the same sort of principles, the same ethos is there. But my goodness, we made so many mistakes. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa. I made so many mistakes, mm. but we've all grown. And a lot of those mistakes are now well in the past. Mm. But the odd thing is that it's not that everybody has to go through the same process all over again. Yeah. If you see what I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. as if new people join the, the Sangha at that new level. Mm. And I'm so impressed by the quality of young people entering into our Sangha these days. I just had a very, very good talk with a, a relatively new Dhammacharini just this morning. And, uh, I was actually asking her advice about something. And I was so impressed by her grasp of principles and her, her thoughtfulness. And, uh, well, I felt sort of proud that, you know, through the evolution of our Sangha, she'd sort of entered at that level. She hadn't had to go through all the mess that we had to go through to yeah. get to that level. Yeah. So I, I feel very encouraged by this, what do they call it, a morphogenetic field. Oh, uh, yeah. It's been called, hasn't it? Rupert Sheldrake and people oh, yeah. like that. There's, yeah. there's some sort of, uh, yes, yeah, psychic field that mm. people pick up on. And uh, yes, old hippie that I am, I, I do believe in all that. Mm. But uh, the, the Sangha is, it is something that exists simply in you and me in our interaction with each other. Mm. But it's also something that is more than you and me. It's like a field in the, in the uh, electromagnetic sense or mm. the, the field of radiation. It's something that radiates from us and around us mm. uh, that is uh, a shared consciousness, um, Bante's third order of consciousness that is neither group consciousness nor individual consciousness, mm. but transcends uh, individual consciousness without denying individual consciousness, and that is, is shared and participated in by all of us and new people fairly quickly can pick up on that mm. and participate in it and uh, even become very strong in it and stronger than the likes of me. It's been quite strange doing this teaching online. And oh. I, I did a, a five week course that finished a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that really surprised me was how people sort of seem to still catch that. Huh. Even mm. though I'm looking into a computer and they're looking yes. into a computer. Yeah. It actually yeah. was really quite encouraging. This, yes. How yeah. much? How much could you could get across? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think probably it's going to be interesting to see how this is after lockdown. Yeah. Because I think we are in very unusual circumstances where people are unusually attentive, mm. uh, and uh, I, I've been very struck by the quality of attention that people give when they're on the internet, uh, in the Zoom, even in Zoom or whatever. Mm. People are really quite focused. I'm exhausted usually after a session because it does use quite a lot of energy, this, this, this intensity of concentration. Yeah. But um, I, I think it, people are unusually open because of, you know, they're, they're in this intensely private world of, of lockdown, whilst being very, very open because everybody else is in the same boat. Yeah. And uh, also um, they've got none of their usual distraction. Well, I'm sure they've got Netflix um, ad nauseam, but um, they haven't got their usual expedience for self, self, self um, identification. Mm. So they're unusually open. I'm going to be very interested to see how it goes afterwards. Yeah, yeah. But, but nonetheless, I have been impressed myself at the quality of communication that can be struck. Mm. That's great. Yeah. Now, look, I'm just, I'm just aware that people might have questions. Mm. And I wanted to move into a phase now that people can, if you want to text in a question to Vajrashura, 
um, I'll relay them to Sabuti. And I've actually already got one that somebody emailed me earlier, which is picking up on one of the points that you just mentioned there. So I'll just, mm -hmm. I'll just read it out. It says, um, this is from Stephen Macken, who's up in um, Dundalk. <clears throat> um, I'm aware that each of us have a sense of I. Huh. A sense that we are the only one having this experience. And even though others speak about it, we still think the I only happens to us. Huh. Can you suggest ways to overcome this I as especially in the current climate, it seems to be fighting stronger than ever to reassert itself. Right. I think the major, major expedient we have is each other. Uh, and uh, somebody uh, uh, mentioned to me this morning uh, something that Bante is alleged to have said, that uh, if you uh, engage in cooperative enterprise with others in the Dhamma, uh, within six years you will have stream entry mm. <laughs> it's one of those lovely uh, provocative statements of bante that when you analyze it closely it is a little easy to literalize <laughs> but so what did he mean by cooperative relations with others if that's what he did say mm. i think what he meant was if you're working closely together living working practicing together closely uh, on the basis of the dhamma mm. you come you have to transcend yourself because you come up against others others who are, are stubbornly i themselves if you see what i mean and who do not deign to exist for my i so i i think this is the most powerful uh, practice we have is uh, coming into deep connection with others on the basis of the dhamma where uh, we, we are un unable to simply dismiss others uh, because we know we share with them the same deep aspiration. Mm. You know, if you if you don't get on with your girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, you change them for another one. Mm. But you cannot change your spiritual friends. You cannot change your fellow order members, your fellow Dhamma Mitras. They're there with you for life, damn it. And they're... they're uh, um, irritatingly um, un, un uh, moldable to one's will fortunately mm. and, and so when you enter into that vividness of interaction with others where you are challenged simply by the other's stubborn existence as something separate from you which exposes your own self-attachment mm. and forces you to transcend yourself and enter into uh, a, a, um, a, a an imaginative engagement with them, which is trans egoic. I think this is the most powerful practice we have. Mm. Of course, uh, meditation um, and especially the Pashana meditation is very helpful for that. Mm. But I think without that dimension, it can easily become self delusion. And I know a lot of people who are self deluded, um, self proclaimed. Uh, stream entrance and so forth. Mm. I, I, it, it phenomenon I've met again and again in my time in the order. As soon as you think you've got something, you, you're pretty clear ego has got it. Uh, and uh, so it, it's vitally important that your, your effort at um, uh, self-transcendence through reflective meditation, uh, through contemplative meditation, is uh, brought into relationship with other and an other that is absolutely resistant to your own self delusion, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And this is one of the most powerful practices Bante's given us. And it refers back to things we talked about at the beginning. No, oh, it does, yeah, very much. This creation of Sangha, this creation of community, and this, especially the service of the Dhamma together. Uh, you, you know, for me, my service of the Dhamma with others who are different to me, very different to me culturally different personality wise different uh different from me in every way has been the the, the greatest solvent of of uh, ego to the extent that i've uh, dissolved it and um that, you, that i know yeah could, that, that's fantastic can you could you give us an example of a particular incident or a period <laughs> of time or because <laughs> um, i know well, you, I, like you do a lot in india for example a lot yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose there in India, I, I spend six months in India each year, 
and, and people are very, very different. They come from a very, very different cultural and, and uh, economic and social background to me. I come from a, a relatively, um, you know, not sort of upper middle, upper middle, middle class, something like that background, uh, well to do, well off, fairly, you know, socially confident, uh, rather um, functionally confident uh, in society, assuming that every door will open for me. And, and uh, there I'm, I'm in contact with people who I deeply respect and deeply love, who have come from backgrounds where they've been taught they're the lowest of the low. And that, uh, you know, at least their, their, their grandparents were taught they were untouchable. Mm. And, uh, uh, and of course, India is a very different culture anyway. It's not Christian or post-Christian. It, it's not even directly post-European enlightenment, if you see what I mean. Mm. So uh, that the interaction with them requires that I ex accept my own conditioning. And I think that, again, is one of the best things that, that our Sangha does. It brings us together with people whose, whose background and conditioning is very different to our own. So, for instance, uh, in, in my career in, in the movement, uh, especially um, at, at the LBC, the London Buddhist Centre, I had to come uh, into interaction with black people, black people whose experience in, in Britain is not a good one who have experienced outright racism all through their life. I've never experienced that. I didn't really believe that it happened. I thought it was just something, you know, that happened in the newspapers, as it were. Mm -hmm. But I met people for whom it was an everyday reality. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to accept the difference in my own uh, uh, experience and conditioning. And I'm a man. I had to accept my conditioning as a man in relation to a, a woman's conditioning mm -hmm. and so on. So I think when when you when you yeah that, that, so that, those are my examples. Mm. I can you know think of particular incidents where uh, I just suddenly realised the huge chasm across which I was communicating. That uh, it, particularly say that in the in the context of people talking uh, about race issues, mm. just suddenly realising I had no idea what they were talking about, mm. no no experience of what they were talking about, mm. and uh, recognising that. I could not dismiss what they were saying. So I had to step across uh, and uh, step out of my own, uh, um, you know, identity and conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think this is the way uh, the conditioning is, is, the ego conditioning is best broken down with, with all the other stuff going on as well. Vipassana yeah. practice yeah. With, with study the Dhamma and so yeah. on. Yeah. 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 And um, do, do please um, send your questions to Vajrashura. My screen is blank as yet. I know you're probably all wrapped. So you haven't had... So <laughs> bored, I, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> so do... do um, maybe we'll have a little break. i sent you a couple, we... Nianadara. There's, there's, there's a couple been sent true to you there. Oh, I can't see them. Maybe Vajrashura could read them out. Ah, here we go. No, I've got, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, that was my lack of technical, there we go. Um, I've heard that Sabuti has said that Ireland could be a Buddhist country. Ah. Could he say a bit more about why and how that might come about? Mm. Yes. Well, th th there, are, there are several things that have led me to say that, you know, it's the sort of thing that uh, one says, which uh, nobody can ever fault you for because it's always in the future. But uh, I, I, I believe that small uh, nations with relatively few people uh, have a, a, um, a, a sort of an ability for cross fertilization to take place that a, a larger population like Britain's does, uh, does not have, like England, for instance, does not have. Wales is different, Northern Ireland is different, Scotland's different. Mm. Uh, but uh, I believe that when there's a smaller uh, um, uh, national identity, there's a stronger sense of cultural identity. So it's much easier to plant something new into the heart of things. Uh, then I believe that in Ireland, uh, because of the, the Catholic Church, actually, uh, and because of the, the nature of Irish culture, and probably because of the, the sense of identity that Ireland, Irish people developed in contrast to the, the British colonial rule, I, I think that, um, there is a, 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 a sort of a, a sense of the mythic, a sense of other dimensions of awareness, other dimensions of consciousness. 
other dimensions of reality, I believe has been kept alive in Ireland uh, more than in, 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 in England, uh, to make one, one contrast, an obvious contrast. Mm. So I, I believe that is very fertile ground for the Dhamma, because there is a sense of, uh, of, of consciousness being greater, uh, consciousness being broader. Uh, and uh, that, that is, I, I hope I'm not deluded, uh, still quite alive in Ireland, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see. I think it's really important. Uh, all my Irish friends have that uh, it, it sense in them, which goes, of course, with a strong love of art, which is quite widespread. And I think in, in Ireland, a bit like in Wales, you know, here I live in a, in a tiny community, a, a farming community, where the, the village is just a few houses, every year they have a nice dead board. And a nice dead board is, is a cultural uh, event where everybody comes together. They have, they have a, a poetry competition with incredibly complex Welsh um, uh, poetic forms, extraordinarily complex. Uh, they have uh, music, singing, they have a choir, male voice choir, uh, the uh, uh, maybe, on, maybe on Owain, Owen Glendower, the last Prince of Wales, the sons of Owen. So, and that they have a play that's a, a play competition. Anyway, that's in this context, but something similar goes on in Ireland, I believe. The same, everybody sings, everybody plays. And that means that the, the aesthetic dimension, the, the imaginative dimension is very much alive. So all of that is very, very uh, helpful for the Dharma. It means consciousness is less divided. I believe the average uh, certainly city consciousness in, in, in Britain is quite alienated, quite divided. I, of course, very aware of that in relation to India, where the, the psyche is more rounded uh, at, at, at a basic level, but a human level. So I, th I think that is very much more alive in Ireland. And you better catch it quick because it's going to go. You're going the way of all, all uh, um, modernist and postmodern societies. Uh, you will do fast. And then lastly, I think you've got this... Um, this rem remnant of an upward gaze that the Catholic Church did give, mm. and uh, for all its corruption and for all its uh, its iniquities, uh, which we all know about now, it did ha it did have does have perhaps still a, a sense of the numinous, a sense of something higher, something beyond. And you know, I, I recognise that from my own Church of England upbringing in the pre, um, re you know, uh, revisionist days when they replaced the the beautiful language of Cranmer, which is Shakespeare's language with, you know, dreadful modernism. Uh, so it still had some quality of something higher, something further. So I believe the Catholic Church did still preserve that for all its failings. And even a sense of the saints as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 we're kind of replacing the ancient gods. So a world that was peopled with higher forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think you've got a tiny moment in time, which if you catch it at the flood, leads on to fortune. Um, and uh, that if you can uh, avail yourselves of this unique, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 year opening, uh, you could really do a serious, I was going to say serious That's damage to Sorry. Ireland, yes. Uh, serious positive damage to Ireland and make the Dhamma really at the heart of things. I think Scotland's the same. Mm -hmm. And in some ways even more so because Scotland is fighting now to, to uh, free itself from the English shadow. Wales is, is a less, less opportunity because mm -hmm. so economically dependent upon England. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, and you have to speak Welsh to really take advantage of it. Yeah, right, yeah. But, but in Ireland, I think uh, there's, there is this wonderful opportunity. So I think what you need to do is to get the Buddhist voice heard as widely as possible, soft sangha all the way through, uh, as soft as a bog and uh, as green, uh, and, and uh, get the Dhamma planted as broadly as you can. We should have Dhamma courses going on in every tiny town throughout um, throughout Ireland and the north as well. It's different kettle of fish, but I think in the north as well. Um, and um, really making sure that the Dhamma voice is heard again and again and again. Uh, I, I heard that Jotiko is doing thought for the day on RTE. See my pronunciation, it's impeccable, isn't it? Um, 
It was just on our YouTube channel, actually, but one day... Oh, 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 how disappointing. Anyway, you should be doing it on RTE uh, very regularly. You should get your voices heard, uh, and you should be uh, have a voice in Parliament in, in the Doyle, uh, and so on. Uh, you should be speaking to um, uh, um, Mr. Varadka, who, who, of course, came. his ancestors came from Maharashtra, where the Dhamma is very strong. We must remind him of that. Uh, um, uh, but yes, uh, I think what you should be thinking of a sort of national campaign, no less. Uh, and you should be thinking of uh, uh, getting to every tiny town and getting the Dhamma, the Dhamma Roadshow uh, out to every place. And then, you know, using every opportunity you can to use national platforms to communicate the Dhamma. That's I'd, love to, I'd love to do it if I was younger and, and so well, I'd love to. Well, you're more than welcome. It's just a little ferry ride across the water. Very, yeah. very brief. Very yeah. easy. We're just yeah. here. Yeah, no, I'd love to come. I do plan to. Yeah. Good. We look forward to it. I certainly um, want to go to Ballina Slow. <laughs> so I, th I think that's a really great note to end on, Sabuti. Um, yeah. Terrific. That, you know, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more that you could say. Um, it's we um, never lost for a word, yeah. <laughs> but we've had a really rich exploration of so many different areas. Um, your connection with Bhante, the, your conviction in the Dhamma as the true refuge, the three jewels even as true refuge, the, the efficacy of community and collective endeavour as a means of breaking down that meddlesome eye. Um, so many things to, to go away and think about. So I'm just really grateful actually that you've given us this opportunity to to mine your knowledge, but also your experience. And mm. um, it's just been really stimulating. I've really enjoyed it myself. Huh. And um, sorry to anyone who didn't get their questions answered, but I think, and it's time, time we let you go. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you very, very much. And, um, and hope to see you again sometime soon. Well, yes, you invite me and I'll come. Great. But, uh, I'd like to thank you, Nyana Dara. Thank you very much indeed for a very uh, good, set of questions which I felt really provoked by oh, good. Uh, and to, to thank all of you for, for attending. Unfortunately my screen has gone strange so I can't see everybody. I don't know what happened at the beginning. It suddenly uh, packed up so I can only see one box oh. but uh, I, I'd have loved to have seen all your faces uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me and invite me back again sometime. Good, will do. Okay, thanks very much.